Oh, my goodness. That's an old one. I mean, it sounds old, but it's brand new. But it, man, boy, that was something. The river of gladness that flows from Emmanuel's veins. Whoo, that's some old hymnal words right there. You know, now that song didn't come from a hymnal. Uh, that's, that's a brand new song, but it makes you think of one. Uh, let's see, what is it? Um, there, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Boy, that's, whoops. I'm telling you, man, that's the gospel right there. I'm just going to tell you. That is the gospel, and that's what the, that's what the word's about, and that's what God came to do and work in our life and wash us clean. I love that phrase, uh, the river of gladness. I was washed in the river of gladness from the blood from Emmanuel's veins. I might be making up the words, but, but uh, <laughs> I'm adding a few words up in there. <laughs> but, but I'm getting the gist of it. That's the gist of it. That's all. I'm, I'm trying to get the gist of it. But man, that's just, you know, that's just a salvation. Those are just salvation words. Uh, blood, washing the blood. I've been plunged beneath the blood that came from Emmanuel's veins. I got saved. Uh, my life's been rearranged. I, uh, he got a hold of my life, and my life won't be the same. I mean, that's just, them are fighting words right there. That, I mean, I get pumped up about that. I, that was one. I heard that thing, I don't know how long ago, but they were working on it. And I said, y'all got to hurry up and get that one ready now because, I mean, that, come on. Come on here. And John did such a great job, man. He always does. He always The band, they, they just do awesomely. Uh, it's amazing. It's not hard to get up and preach after our band plays. Uh, you know, I have been in places before, and I've been preaching so many years, and I did, I've done revivals. And have you ever heard of a revival? You ever, you've heard that word before? And you're like, okay. All right. I didn't ask you if you had been revived. I just asked you if you had heard of the word. Have you heard the word revival? Well, the word revival, that's one of those old, uh, that's one of those old time words. I don't even know. I guess people still have revivals nowadays, huh? Mm. I haven't heard of any mm. And, you know, we're just not kind of in the circuit, I guess, to have. But anyway, when I, when I was going, boy, boy you'd, you'd go and, and, and a pastor would invite you to come preach a revival at the church, you know, and man, you'd go and you'd preach Jesus and salvation and and repentance and righteousness and man, I mean, you'd stomp and snort and bellow and yep, spit yep, and yep, yep. whoo, especially if you were outside. Man, I've been outside in some of these brush arbors and stuff like that, tabernacles. Boy, be stomping all over that place and just giving the devil fits, boy. And it would be, man, I'm telling you, giving him down the country, you know, I mean, we'd, we'd be all over him. And the people would be shouting about it, and boy, you'd give an invitation, and people would come and give their heart to the Lord. They'd fall out just about coming down there. They'd be under conviction so heavy it would be. And it was just a mm, oh, different day, <laughs> different, different day, different day. The Lord's still working powerfully and mightily, but uh, you know we, we just do things in some different ways now and, and so forth. But uh, God's, God's still after the same thing. And that's to bring glory and let us see the glory of God so that our lives can be satisfied with the glory of God through Jesus Christ that lives on the inside of us and we can manifest that glory to the world. I say that to kind of get a little running start on what I'm going to be dealing with today because uh, today is, is uh, we have a past, I have a past, you know, we've been dealing with, with hurt, handling life's hurts. And we've dealt with some of the very common ones and very painful ones like rejection and anger and disappointment and what to do when you have storms in your life and how to throw out anchors and what anchors need to be and so forth. And then when your children grow beyond your control, which they always do, and that's really when they're born, that's what, where we're headed with them. I mean, that's the purpose for, for being a parent is to bring your children up so that one of these days they'll grow past your control. And so we dealt with those kind of things. And then last week, I dealt with, some, with, some, with frustration with other people, which is very easily done in life. It's very easy to get frustrated with other people. Yeah, right, just get in the car with them. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Just live with them. You'll get frustrated with them. Work with them. Uh, get in the car with them. I mean, just be around them a little bit. And today I want to go just a, a tad deeper with this thing of frustration because whether we like to admit it or not, I know many people won't admit it because they're scared. 
they're afraid that God's going to turn them into a crispy critter if they say anything like this, like, God, I'm angry, I'm frustrated with you. But I'm going to tell you, if you're with the Lord very long, uh, you are, are going to be frustrated because God doesn't do things the way we think they ought to be done most of the time. And many of, <laughs> many of the things uh, that happen with the Lord uh, disappoint our expectations. I mean, what do you do when God is at the center of your expectations and he lets you down? I mean, you don't get what you pray for. Uh, it seems like he's. It seems like the heavens are brass and no prayers getting through. You're not. You're not only not getting what you pray for. You're not getting anything. I mean, you just. It seems like God somehow's just abandoned the whole situation, and 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 it's very frustrating when your expectations of Him are that He loves you and that He's watching your life, and that if you will ask Him, that He will get involved in your life and and do things that will be a blessing and help and so forth in your life according to your expectations. So it's very frustrating to serve the Lord, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, very frustrating. I've been with him a long time, and, and I've been with him, and I, I've, I've actually accused him before. Lord, I, I can see why you don't have any more followers than you do the way you want, treat the ones you got. Um, I can see that. And, uh, of course, he pats me on the head and, says, you'll get over it. He's patted me so many times, that's why I don't have any hair in my head. <laughs> let, me give you, let me give you a story here. This is, comes from John chapter 11. This is a, it's a wonderful story about uh, two sisters and a brother that had some expectations from Jesus, earthly Jesus that walking on the earth, because they were his friends. And it begins in verse 1, John chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Martha who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now this is interesting. I'm just calling your attention to it because uh, the event described in verse 2 hasn't happened yet. <laughs> John takes the event that hasn't happened. It's going to happen in the next chapter. In, the, in chapter 12, that event is going to happen. But John wants to, I, I guess, bring it back and say, hey, I want you to see just how much Mary loved Jesus. Because this is a perfect example of how much she loved him. She took her perfume, that costly vessel, broke it on his feet, and then took her hair and wiped his feet. That is a very loving thing to do. Yeah, therefore the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now that's a little bit presumptuous, I would say, because after all, Jesus loves everybody, right? I mean, really, uh, for God so loved the world, <laughs> everybody in the world, look at your neighbor and say, that means you. Yeah. All right, and here's the, here are the sisters the sisters just basically send a message to him and says, hey, our brother, uh, no, wait, that says, hey, uh, the one you love is sick. Uh, kind of light on details, wouldn't you say? I mean, what, what kind of sick? I mean, is it, we, is it just something that he's, you know, uh, uh, is it a fever? Is it, what, what is it that's going on? You don't have any details, just the one you love is sick. So here again in verse 3 now, and I'm just pointing this out because I want you to feel what's happening here, because this is why John wrote it this way. I, I feel positive the Holy Spirit uh, inspired him this way, because he wants, wants us to get the real feel of this thing. And so far, we've been three verses, and we've been told twice how much love there is between Jesus and Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So he wants us to get it. This is not, these are not strangers. This is not somebody who just comes up and makes some request and he doesn't even know who they are. These are people that they have had a relationship and that they really like each other. As a matter of fact, they love each other. They love each other enough that they could just send a message and say, your boy's sick, the one you love, you know, and Jesus would know exactly who they were talking about. Yes. And when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. So Jesus 
evaluation of what's happening is Lazarus is sick, right? Okay. Well, this sickness is not unto death. And let me just uh, clarify that just a second because Lazarus is going to die and Jesus knows he's going to die. So don't think that Jesus said that not knowing that Lazarus was going to be dead by the time he got there because a few verses later, you're going to see him just say it right out loud to his disciples. Lazarus is dead. I mean, you know, so Jesus already knows that the sickness that Lazarus has, that he's going to hang around long enough and not go down there and he's going to let Lazarus die is basically what he's going to do. But what he says here is the purpose for the sickness that Lazarus has is not that Lazarus would die. That's what he's saying. This sickness that's going on with Lazarus is not for the purpose of bringing Lazarus' life to an end. This sickness is designed to do one thing, and that is to glorify the Father and to glorify Jesus Christ. Reminds you of that miracle that was done a few chapters before in, in the Gospel of John in chapter 9, where there was a blind person on the side of the road, and here came Jesus and his disciples, and the blind person said, Jesus, heal me, and they shushed him away, and Jesus went over to him anyway, and, and the disciples looked at Jesus and said, uh, hey, Jesus, which one sinned, his parents or him, that he was born blind that way? And Jesus said, neither. He said he was born this way so that the glory of God can be manifested at this time. And so Jesus says, uh, the purpose of this is not to, for Lazarus to die. The purpose is that, uh, that, that you and I, God the Father and God the Son, you and I would be glorified through this wonderful thing. Now, verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So there's the third time in five verses that John wants to get to us to understand how much they loved each other and what a loving situation this was and how much Jesus truly did love them and they loved him. And so uh, uh, the purpose was obviously to set us up. To set us up for what? Well, for a compassionate miracle. <laughs> I mean, he's told us three times in five verses that these people are tight. And so our expectation is that Jesus loves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I wrote this formula, by the way, in your notes, if you have the notes. Jesus loves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Plus, Lazarus is sick. Plus, the sisters tell Jesus Plus, Jesus can do anything equals Jesus comes and heals Lazarus. That's the expectation. So John is setting us up to say, you need to expect to see Jesus do something compassionately miraculous in Lazarus' life. And he kind of drags us along to make sure that we understand how much love and how deeply they cherish each other so that we will develop that expectation. So we come to verse 6. And the reason I think he does this and talks to us about how much they love each other is because what happens in verse 6 is the exact opposite of what you would think would happen if someone loved one another. When we read verse 6, you'll be saying, that's not how people who love each other treat one another. Verse 6 is anything but an example of somebody loving somebody else. And so he has to spend five, five verses telling us how much they did and giving us examples of how much they did love each other. So when we read verse 6, we would be totally blown away by what in the world happens in verse 6. So verse 6 reads, So when he heard that he was sick, he immediately arose and went to Bethany and carried his disciples and healed Lazarus. That's not what it said. Well, that's what, it, that's what it ought to say. When he heard that Lazarus was sick, he went down and he laid hands on Lazarus and brought Lazarus up, and the two sat down and ate a meal together. Well, that's what you would expect. No, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, 
he stayed two more days in, in the place where he was. Uh, and, and just to shake you up a little more about this, as if, as if you need to be shaken up a little bit more about what Jesus did, staying there two days and all, it just, it just kind of makes it a little bit worse. That word so, you see it at the start of the verse, six? So, now, I don't want to strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, and I'm not one of these kind of people that go around trying to make tiny, you know, words be significant. And every little tiny word in a verse be something real big and special. But this one is special because it's there in the original language. The, the, the word so, which means therefore, is there. I mean, it's part of the vernacular. It's what, and, and, and I just pointed out to say to you that uh, if, if you'd use the word but right there, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and, and, and Lazarus, but when he heard that he was sick, he waited two days. If you use but, you might think, well, you know, Jesus might have been too busy to shake loose. I mean, something else might have been going on that was terribly critical that Jesus be there, and so he would have come, but he wasn't available. Now, that really doesn't stop a lot, because as we know from following Jesus, Jesus didn't even have to be there to heal Lazarus. There's a centurion servant in Matthew 8. The centurion comes and said, hey, my servant is sick. And Jesus said, all right, let's go. And the servant said, hey, you don't need to go. I'm a centurion. I know I have soldiers under me. And if I just tell my soldier, go, he's going to go and do whatever I say. So, Lord, you don't have to come down there where he is. Just speak the word and he'll be made well. And Jesus said, I like that. He said, you know what? Your servant's well right now. And, and, and sure enough, when he got back home, the servant was well from the time Jesus spoke that he was well. So he really wouldn't have even had to cut loose to go down and heal Lazarus, or he could have just sent him some spit, you know. <laughs> you know he's real good at that, right? I mean, he could have sent him like some spit with a little bit daubed in mud, made a little clay, and say, hey, take this down there and put it on Lazarus' head, and he'll be all right. But the word is so. And so implies... So implies that he did it on purpose. Uh, read it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Therefore, when he heard that he was sick, therefore, let's, I mean, just read it out like it really is. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Therefore, because he loved them so much, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he purposely waited two days and let the man die. Is that, is that, is that radical? <laughs> I mean, really, is that, that, that's, that's amazing, isn't it? Is that how people who love each other treat each other? To let the man die? That's love? Well, the only way it can be love is for us to understand what love really is from the perspective of God because it obviously is what happened here. On purpose, Jesus, knowing what was going to happen and knowing that the man was going to be dead by the time he got there, he lets his friend who he loves die because he loves him so deeply. <laughs> yeah. So what's up with this? Well, just one little thing to remember before I, I get into anything else. Just remember, uh, sometimes following the Lord can be very frustrating. Just remember that. It's like, I, I doubt any of you men have experienced this, but you ladies, I'm sure you've experienced this. You've gone to a department store and you, 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 tr you found a dress you liked or a nice suit of some kind and you put it on and you went out into their, into their area at the store and you looked at it in the mirror and, you know, you looked at it and looked and you looked at the color and you looked at the fit and you looked at everything that had to do with it and, and, and you said, uh, man, this, this, I think this will work. Man, look, it makes me look about 20 pounds slimmer there. Yeah. Absolutely, this is my color. You know, what does it do to my face? 
Am I a winter or a spring? <laughs> and it's beautiful and you like it. And then when you get at home and you get in front of a mirror at your home and you try it on, it just doesn't look the same, does it? You say, what happened? It looks so beautiful in the store. May I tell you what happened? It's the lights. Do you know the department stores, and, and this is just something I learned when I worked in New Orleans. I had uh, my, the, my boss in New Orleans, his wife was a marketer for one of these major chains. And her job was to make those dressing areas with mirrors do what it needs to do to make you look the way you want to look so that you will purchase the dress that you are wearing. And they spend millions of dollars testing and, 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 and structuring these things so that they can get just the right lights, just the right shadows, just the right wattage, just the right color of light to make that happen. But when you got home, what you had in the store wasn't what you had at home, right? And so it was frustrating. I mean, I hope my preaching's not like that. You know, I, you get in here and we got the lighting and the sound and I'm going to tell you these stories and stuff. And then when you get home, you're all pumped up about things. And then when you get home and you start looking at the notes, you go, wait a minute, that's not what he writes. And you're all disappointed. I don't want to be that way in life. I'm just saying to you that when you got saved and came to Jesus, if you had the expectation that when you came to the Lord, that from that point on, everything was going to be great in your life. And that every day was going to be happiness from the Lord. And you and your wonderful family were going to sit down every night after you finished supper. And you were going to sit on the couch and you were going to hold hands together. And you were going to sing worship songs to the Lord and quote Psalm 23 in Hebrew while you dance around in the presence of God. If that's what you expected from Jesus, you were going to be disappointed. So remember, serving the Lord can be very frustrating just in itself because Jesus was the master at frustrating people, right? I mean, look at it. He, all, for, for millennia, thousands of years, the prophets told us that a king was coming and he was going to be a great king of Israel and he was going to, and he was going to, and he was going to deliver his people from their oppression and so forth. And so uh, all those thousands of years, the earth waited for a king to come. Glory to God, a king, man. A king, a mighty conquering king. And so certainly when the king was going to be born, what God would do is God would put him in a palace somewhere with uh, riches and royalty and majesty and power and all of that because he was the king of the world. So we expect a king. We're going to have him born in a palace, right, God? Nope. We're going to put him in a stable. Well, at least this Jesus would be born to a royal couple, right? I mean, a couple of great genetic people that are rulers and they are beautiful and they're wonderful and they have a very stable family and a very stable life. I mean, at least we could have him come to a royal family, right, God? Nope. A, ver a, a teenage virgin in a hick town on the backside of nowhere. Well, certainly when he comes, we're going to have pomp and circumstance and fanfare so that the whole world will know finally after all of these millennia we have the king of God born on the earth and everybody will hear about it and they'll rush down there and they'll look at Jesus in this marvelous place and be captivated with how Jesus looks and awed by the presence and we'll let it be known all over the world right God? Nope. We're going to have him born in obscurity and the only people that are going to know about it are a group of temple shepherd and their musty little sheep out on the farm. Well, when he begins his ministry, he's going to be flamboyant, right? I mean, he's going to be captivating. People are going to follow him everywhere. And then he's going to just gain crowds more and more and more because, I mean, who could resist the Son of God? And so Jesus does a miracle. He feeds 5,000 people one day and everybody says, wow. That's Jesus, and then big crowds started following behind Jesus, and then Jesus 
comes to them and they say, all right, we're following you, Jesus, and we're committing ourselves to you. But he says, well, you can go away because I'm not committing myself to you because you're following me, not because you want me, but because you want the loaves and fishes. That's what you want. So just get on away from me. I don't have anything to do with you. Boy, that's how you win the world, right? Whew. Come on, Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you don't want a worshipful king. You want a burger king. That's who you want. So you can have it your way, you know. Uh, move on, move on, move on. Move on, move on, move on. And, 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 and then he walks down the road from there and he sees a blind man on the side of the road and he's going to do a wonderful, compassionate, miraculous work and impress everybody. It, but instead of doing the work and everybody cheering, and yay, Jesus, that, he spits on the ground and makes the mud. And <laughs> half the people leave because they're offended because somebody's down there playing with mud and spit offends people, you know, fancy people. And then, maybe worst of all, Peter's mother-in-law gets sick. Do you know Peter had a mother-in-law? Read Matthew 8. It's there. Story Peter had a mother-in-law, which means Peter was married, right? All right, just wonder. Just, you know, never mind. I don't want to start all that argument. I was just going to say the Catholics had Peter as the first pope. I did get married, but he was married. He had a mom-in-law. His mom-in-law, his mother-in-law was sick. And Jesus just happened to come by Peter's house where his mother-in-law was staying. And she was sick, and Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Peter was very disappointed in the fact that Jesus had healed his mother-in-law. And as a matter of fact, some scholars believe that's why Peter denied Jesus three times. <laughs> Betty ever even knew him. <laughs> Two months. It was Friday night, brother. That's what did it. But see, it seems that the only one who was not frustrated with Jesus <coughs> was the one he came to please. Our expectations get busted many times when we follow Jesus because he doesn't act like we think he should act and he doesn't do things in a way we think he should do things. So the key to understanding this event, this situation that's going on here is to remember what Jesus said in verse 4, that this illness is not so that, that Lazarus can die. This illness is not for the purpose of death. It's for the glory of God so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Now, you'll notice the first thing that Jesus does when he hears that Lazarus is sick is that he associates this sickness with the glory of God. Lazarus, your friend, is sick. He says, oh, good. I'm going to be glorified in this. And the Father's going to be glorified in this. And so Jesus, right off the bat, tells us that this sickness in Lazarus' life is not going to be handled like most people would handle sickness in, a friend, in, a, in the life of a friend. And this is something that you have to remember when you're with the Lord that there are two things that are, that are different about God from us. One is God has a different perspective. And the second is God has a different priority. Now, for us, the obvious pr perspective of a friend being sick, and we would know that this friend is going to die, from our perspective the obvious move would be for us to hurry quickly and treat him so that he would not die, as if death were the greatest of all enemies of humanity. That's our perspective. Our perspective is, man, death is the most horrible thing in existence. Because our priority is to keep everybody alive 
so that we can enjoy their presence. But according to Jesus, it's a loving thing. He's practicing love. He spent five verses telling us how much love was there so we wouldn't miss the fact that this thing was filled with love in order, in, in verse 6, to show us that he doesn't go there for two days because he loves Lazarus and Mary and Martha and you and me so much that he's going to delay himself so that the glory of God and the glory of Jesus can be made manifest to all people in in this, in, in, in this world. Because obviously the perspective of God is different from our perspective. In God's perspective, death and resurrection, the, time, the amount of time between death and resurrection is nothing compared to eternity. In other words, from God's perspective, a moment, a, a death is, 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 is followed by a resurrection. And whether that be five minutes or five years or 50 years, it's a very short time compared to eternity. So from God's perspective, death is not that horrible monster. Death is just an opportunity to move on to a resurrection. And evidently to God, love is doing whatever you have to do to help people see the glory of God and to, have, and to help them be satisfied with the glory of God. Because it is God's aim in this world that we would be satisfied with the glory of God because we reflect God most when we are most satisfied with him. And it is his glory that draws us to him. What is it in John, the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without Him, not anything made that was made. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among men, and we beheld Him as the only begotten of God, full of grace and full of truth. <clears throat> what is it that draws us to God? the glory of God? What is it that will never change? The glory of God. What is it that sustains our life? The glory of God. What is it that will make a difference in our life and draw us to him? What is it that we need most in life? The glory of God. So God says, you know what love is? Love is giving people and doing whatever's necessary to get people what they really need most in life. And what they need most is not to see another miracle. Because I'll just remind you that Lazarus was not the only miracle that Jesus ever did. Jesus raised others from the dead. Jesus healed others. Jesus, I mean, Jesus was a major hit on the, on, on the conference circuit. Thousands of people came out to listen to Jesus speak. People watched Jesus walk on water. Jesus watched people raise the dead, heal the sick, put blinded eyes back open, cast demons out. It wasn't another miracle from Jesus that people needed to see. What they needed to see was the glory of God manifested so the glory of God could call them to Christ. And so God said, I'm going to take a family that loves me and can handle the fact that I don't do exactly what they want me to do, and I'm going to, I'm going to allow the world to see that I am not just a one-trick pony I'm not, I'm not simply a walking miracle worker, that I am actually the resurrection and the life and that every person that ever believes in me will be resurrected just like Lazarus is about to be resurrected. So that, that's God's perspective. And God's pr priority was that, that, that all of us might see and believe. There are two great purposes in all things. I was thinking about this, and, and let me just, this might sound a little philosophical, might just be my thinking. But, but, but think about it with me. Help me think about it. I mean, you may ha have to go home and help me think about it, but think about it. If you, if you come up with anything different than this, then let me know, all right? 
All right. There are two great purposes in all things, in everything that happens on this earth. The first one is God wants to demonstrate his glory through Christ. Why do we come to church? So that God can demonstrate his glory through Christ. Why do we sing? Why do we pray? Why do we, why do we follow him? Uh, what is it that God does in any miraculous event? It is that God would, God would show us his glory through Jesus Christ. And the second thing is that we humans would see that glory and begin to treasure Jesus for the true treasure that he really is. And we would understand that our life is blessed when our life is filled with a, with a true value and a true treasure of the glory of God which fills our life. So Jesus said, all right, I'm going to wait a couple of days here, guys. And then verse 7, then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Day late and dollar short, Jesus, isn't it, right? I mean, it, 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 you passed a, a window of opportunity there. Yeah, he's already, he's already dead. But Jesus says, all right, let's go to Judea again. Then the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews have sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Now, this is true because in chapter 10, we've started reading at verse 1 of chapter 11, but in chapter 10, Jesus escaped with his life right at the end of chapter 10. The Jews were going to stone him to death. Yeah, he had taught them, you know, in the first of chapter 10, he teaches them, I'm the good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep, I'm in the door of the sheepfold, and all that's ever come before me are robbers and thieves and so forth. And all that. He's teaching them that. And then when he gets through teaching them that, the Jews say, well, were you, are you talking about us? And, and then they get all fired up and riled up. And they said, listen, we've been asking you if you're the Messiah, and if you are, just tell us. And he said, yeah, I am. And then they said, well, we're going to stone you to death. And they, 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 they pushed Jesus really almost to the edge of town, and they were going to stone him to death, but he just disappears out of their sight. And then he, go, then he, he goes a little north and a little east back up to Judea, and he ends up back in Jerusalem. And when he gets there, he hears that Martha and Mary, that Lazarus is sick at Martha and Mary's house. So, so, so he's, just, he's just escaped with his life. Of course, they would have never, <laughs> they'd have never done anything to him anyway. But... The disciples said, Rabbi, lately the Jews have sought to stone you, and are you going up there again? Jesus answered, are there not, just a little parable, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if he walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after he said this to them, he said, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might wake him up. Then his disciples said, well, Lord, if he's just asleep, then he'll get well, right? We don't need to go up there if he's just asleep. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> this, is, this shows you Jesus knew it all from the beginning, right? This wasn't a surprise to Jesus that when he waited two days, Lazarus was going to die. No, he knew all that. And, and notice what he says in verse 15. Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Then in verse 15, he said, and I'm glad for your sake that I was not there that you might believe. In other words, Jesus said, if I was there, I probably would have stopped him from dying. Now, if I stopped him from dying... The glory of God is not going to be able to be made manifest. And so Jesus says to him in verse 15, I'm glad that I wasn't there for your sakes because uh, when I show you my glory, the human counterpart to the glory is we believe. So when you see my glory, you are going to believe, Jesus said. If I had been there, you'd never see the glory and you might not believe. Nevertheless, let's go to him. Verse 16, then Thomas, who is called Didymus, which means the twin, Diddy, so Diddy says to his fellow disciples, <laughs> let us also go that we may die with him. I'm thinking that Diddy's probably a teenager. What you think? I mean, he's, getting, he's so dramatic, right? 
Teenagers love drama. If you haven't, if you, if you don't know this, you, had a, you don't have any of them. And if they don't have drama happening in their life, they'll make some up. So next time they make some up, get you a little string. What I would suggest you do is get you a little card and punch a little hole, put a little spring in it, and write on it, Diddy. And then when they, when they get all dramatic, just hang it around their neck. All right, Diddy, you got you going on here. Diddy says, uh, we, well, guys, we'll just go on up there and we'll die with Jesus. And so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. So when Jesus gets to the, to the place where Lazarus is, he finds out that Lazarus has been in a tomb. Lazarus has been, has been dead for four days. What's this about? Well, I put in your notes a little information out of the Talmud. Are you guys familiar with the Talmud? The Talmud, there are two, there are two writings, two, two uh, very important writings in, in, in Judaism. One is the Torah. The Torah is basically the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's the law of God, written by God. It's, a written, it's the written word of God, the Torah. The Talmud is a written version of the oral laws of God. It deals with uh, government and, um, and the way systems are run and so forth. So the Talmud is like a twin with the Torah on, on government of the Jewish people. And in the Talmud, and I wrote it in your notes, in, um, in Kabbalah 100 verse 7, the, the Talmud says that when someone dies, that the spirit of that person hovers in, in the presence for three days. And then on the fourth day, the spirit leaves and you can intern the person. You can put the person in the grave. That's what the, they teach. Now, this is not right. This is not true. This is not what God said. This is just, some, this is just an oral tradition of the Talmud. But that's what the Jews believed. And so because that's what the Jews believed, Jesus said, um, all right, we're going to leave him in the ground for four days because um, the Talmud said he's going to be, he's gonna, after four days, he's going to be dead. And the Jews will know that Lazarus is actually dead, that this is not one of those little slipshod miracles. Because I listed for you in your notes that uh, of all the miracles that are recorded in the Bible, there are 11 of them. And nine of those 11 miracles that are recorded in the Bible uh, there were re of resurrections, those resurrections happened in three days or less. There are only two resurrections in the Bible that took longer than three days, and one is the Old Testament saints that were resurrected when Jesus was resurrected. And I know you're going, what in the world is that all about? And some of you, we've read it many times. Yeah, when Jesus, went, when Jesus was resurrected, a lot of the tombs, a lot of the graves around Jerusalem broke up, and a lot of the Old Testament saints were seen walking around in the city of Jerusalem. And so, and so, so uh, Jesus said, all right, I want everybody to know that Lazarus is dead and that this is not some swoon theory, that this is not something that just happened. And so... I want them to know that he's dead, dead, dead. So first day, Lazarus is dead. Second day, Lazarus is dead. Third day, Lazarus is dead. Now fourth day, when Jesus gets there, Lazarus is dead, 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 dead. So this is going to be a legitimate miracle, and nobody's going to say, well, you know, if we, you know he really didn't die. He just kind of swooned around, and um, you know, they just revived him back to life. So Jesus waits four days, and when he had been in the tomb four days, Jesus comes back, and when and when he heard that, he said, uh, well, wait a minute, let me go on. That's, I put those in there in case I need them. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, and it was about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. So there are lots of Jews there, and, and, and there's, a big, there's a big group and a big meeting up there. Verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out and met him. Of course she did, Right? She's angry about this. Yeah. She wants to say something to Jesus. And I'm sure, now look, I'm sure that when Martha went out there, can't you see it? She has that, she has that hand on the hip like this. And Mary sits in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, 
Mr. Jesus, where have you been? I thought we were your friend. This is your friend, man. We've been waiting for you. Where have you been? Why have you waited so long? If you had been here, then my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I want to just make you aware of what's going on in these three verses. Uh, one of the favorite tricks of the devil is going on in these three verses right here. In these three verses, the devil loves to, 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 to keep us bouncing between two continuums, the past and the future. And he can keep us upset because there's nothing you can do about the past except get angry about it. And there's nothing personal about the future. It's all uh, uh, group-oriented. It's, it's, it's all... It's all uh, uh, oh, what would we call it? Um, it's, um, I'm searching for a word. Well, anyway, it, it's not personal. You can't get personal. It's all group oriented. And notice what happened. Now, Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, the past, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, which is an encouragement by the devil to keep you stirred up about something that God didn't do in the past that can't be done now. Well, God, if you'd, have just, if, you'd have just, if you'd have just touched my father, then my father would have been a different man and I would have been brought up in a house that was different and he wouldn't have abused my mom. And right now, I might be a really great man of God if you had done it back then, but you didn't do it. Or if God, if you had protected us from that accident that happened, then we might both be sitting right here in this sanctuary right now and having a great life. God, if you'd if you'd if you'd have worked in if you'd have worked in that in, in my counselor, they might have given me good advice, and then I wouldn't have gotten on drugs, and I'd be I, I wouldn't be fighting this demon that I'm fighting right now. God, if you'd have just done those things, then my life would have been different. But the past is past, and you can't do anything about the past except stay mad about the past. And so the devil loves to keep you in the past. And here's Martha saying, you know, if you'd have done this, then this would have happened. And then she says, he, he bounces her to the future. Jesus says, your brother's going to rise again. You know this? And she said, well, yeah, I know. One of these days in the resurrection when everybody else rises, he's going to rise again. In other words, in the future out there one day, my brother's going to rise again. So he keeps bouncing between the past and the future in which the past, nothing can be done about in the future is so impersonal that, that it's, it's just, it's out of, it, 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 it doesn't minister to you in any way. But re even in the middle of all of what, of, of, of the past and the, and the future continuum here, Martha has enough sense and enough cognition evidently in verse 22 to say, but even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Uh, so, Lord, uh, even now, as, as late as it is, he's already gone. If you, will, if you will just put your whole mind to it, if you'll, just, if, you'll just, if you'll just focus and concentrate and ask your father, your father will bring him back even now. Because it, it, like old Yogi Berra used to say, what, it ain't over till it's over. And some of the greatest, uh, some, of our, some of our greatest miracles can happen on the battlefield where some, some of our greatest uh, defeats seemingly take place. How many of you have ever been in one of those hopeless situations where it just seemed like everything's lost and then all of a sudden, boom, um, something happens and you, I mean, you've been on a ball field. I guess that's probably the easiest thing to, to compare it to. Did any of you happen to watch I think it's back in about 1987. It shows you how, how my mind remembers. Uh, not current, but back then. When Miami played, uh, played Boston College, Doug Flutie, does that name, does that sound familiar? You know, you remember uh, last play of the game, uh, Florida, Florida my, University of Miami had a beat, and then boom, down there, 
Phelan catches the ball in the end zone. Touchdown, ball, game's over, everybody celebrates. It ain't over till it's over, right? <laughs> if you left early from watching that, which I almost did because I was back then I was interested in stuff like that. But I almost left it. I almost left it before the before the miracle happened. And so Martha says, if you'll just if you'll just pray and ask God, God will give you what you pray for. And then Jesus says to her in verse 25 and 26, 27, Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Pretty good statement. And, when, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that. <laughs> I believe that you're the Christ. So Jesus looks at her and Jesus says, Martha, do you believe that I'm the resurrection and the life? And do you believe that anybody who believes in me will never die? Do you believe this? And Martha basically looks at him and says, Lord, I don't really know about all that. I don't, I don't, I've learned not to presume, you know. I've learned not to take for granted what you're going to do about something. But if you say it, I believe it. And I, I, I know one thing. You're, I believe that you are who you say you are and that you are the Son of God and that whatever you say is going to be what happens in life. I do believe that. So one, one, last, little, one last little thought here. Uh, between the death of Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus, there was four days. Now, I know that many of us have a feeling that the death of Lazarus was not really all that bad because our feeling is Lazarus died, but Jesus resurrected him. So Lazarus' death is not that bad because he was going to be resurrected in four days. But I, I, I will have you to remember Lazarus died. Death's not easy, guys. I mean, it's not easy for someone to pass, pass away out of our life. As far as Lazarus knew, Jesus never came. Jesus, Lazarus was waiting on Jesus to come, I'm sure. Jesus never came. As far as Lazarus knew, his sisters had to watch him die and mourn and grieve and see him breathe his last breath. All the friends of the family, they had to gather together. They had to have a funeral service. They had to put him in the ground. And, 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 and certainly their pain was the same. They had no idea that Jesus was coming. And so between the death of Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus, there were four days that I'm sure his family could not see how his death was going to be for the glory of God. Do you know when his, you know when, when the glory was revealed to them? At his resurrection. When he was resurrected, they saw the glory of God. I'm just saying to us that what Jesus desires in our life is that our life would reflect his glory and that we would see his glory and we would be satisfied with his glory. And, and I know the word satisfied might sound like a goofy word to use in connection with the glory of God but that the glory of God would, would stabilize our life and we would see the glory of God and it would affect our lives and affect what we believe and how we believe. And all of the things about our life and how God reflects himself in his glory will be revealed in us. And we might not see it now, just like, Latin, just like Martha and Mary. Didn't, they, they didn't see how Lazarus was going to glorify, Lazarus' death was going to glorify God. It wasn't his death that glorified God. It was his resurrection four days later. And when the resurrection happens, all of those things are revealed. So in our own life, there are many things that die and many things that we bring to the Lord. We, we bring it and we say, Lord, we need this and we want you to do this and we pray about this and we're asking you to take care of this. And we're, we have all kinds of requests and, 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 and wants that we bring before the Lord. And the Lord sometimes 
miraculously, those things happen, you know, and it's like, thank you, Jesus. But a lot of times they don't happen, especially they don't happen in the way that we think that they ought to happen or in our timing. And just remember, the Lord loves us and the Lord's going to reveal his glory. When are we going to see his glory? Maybe not now, but in the resurrection and when God works in our life. And I know that many of you have seen the glory of God and it's called you to repentance and called you to the Lord. And that's what God is after, that our life would be filled with his presence. Frustrated with God. <laughs> oh my, yeah. Well, live life. God, God loves us. God moves in our life and he'll work in our life mightily if we won't quit, if we don't leave too early. It ain't over till it's over, guys. Don't leave too early.